Hey guys, Jeff here. I'm sorry it's been a while since I uploaded new content. I've been a little busy. I had some personal obligations. I'm also in the process of writing my fifth book. And it's the first time that I'm working with a publisher on one of my books. So I have to cater to their schedule and their deadlines. So it's been a little crazy here, but I did want to shoot this quick video. I actually got a request from someone who was watching another one of my videos on how to run a rescue. Uh, and they were asking me what the adoption process is when I try to choose an adopter for a dog that I have available for adoption. So here, uh, Angel asked, can you do one on the requirements, what we should do as a rescue, like background checks? And I asked her, uh, like, uh, pre meaning like pre-adoption approval process, that kind of stuff. And she had mentioned, yes, I just started a nonprofit dog rescue and she's getting everything together. She wants to do a little research on how she should go about choosing the right people to adopt to. Uh, so that's what I wanted to do in this video here. So the best way to do it is I'm going to run through my, uh, my adoption, my pre-adoption process, meaning the adoption application, uh, the things that we do as far as background checks, reference checks, things along those lines, uh, as well as my adoption contract I'll throw in, in in this video as well. And, you know, if anyone wants to check these documents out, they're right on our rescues website. Uh, I'll put the link right here, pityrescue.org or pityrescue.com. Uh, and, you know, our adoption applications and forms and our foster to adopt application is all up there on our website. But I'll go through each line item here in this video and hopefully it helps Angel out uh, and anyone else who's starting a rescue or maybe you're starting to volunteer and you're going to be doing some reference checks or going through the adoption approval process for another rescue. Uh, so hopefully this, visit, uh, this video will help. So let's jump right to it and uh, we'll take a look at the uh, adoption application first and then we'll jump into the contract. Okay, so this is my, for, my adoption and foster application. This is not the contract. This is just the application. Uh, let, me, let me make my screen a little smaller here so you can see more of that. And let me see if I can zoom this in a little bit so I can make this a little bigger for you guys to see on the screen. Uh, obviously these applications are, are they're on uh, Pity Rescue's website as well. So, um, so th this is the application, obviously just by the application and asking the right questions on the application, there's certain things that, that people will reveal as far as what we call red flags. Now a red flag doesn't necessarily mean that someone isn't a good candidate to adopt a dog from us. It's just an area that piques our interest where we might have to take a step back and say, all right, let's probe this topic a little deeper with the person. Maybe they just don't know or aren't aware of something and we, we can use it as an opportunity to educate them. Or maybe it's something glaring that we're not comfortable with their approach to dog care and dog you know, guardianship, dog ownership, whatever you want to call it. So, uh, so the application process does help us isolate areas of concern. So, uh, you know, basic stuff, personal information, uh, you'd be surprised. I've had applications and people put addresses that don't exist. I mean, that simple. If someone puts an address that don't, ex that doesn't exist, um, I'm, you know, and I'm not one to blow people off. I just tell them, look, you know, I, I, you put an inaccurate address. The, this address doesn't, doesn't even exist. Um, there have been times where People said, oh, I just moved in with my uncle or something. I put the wrong address, which is totally fine. That's why we have to tell people. And I mean, for lack of a better phrase, call them out on their inaccuracies, right? To, to probe because an honest mistake is an honest, honest mistake. We don't want to deprive a dog of a great home because an honest mistake was made on an application, you know? Uh, but again, we do want to look out for red flags. Um, I like to ask uh, all, you know, all members of the household and their age, it's important, uh, not that we discriminate, but we may have a dog that isn't suitable for people under a certain age, or maybe they're too rambunctious, hyper, or something for a, a home that has geriatric people in the home, right? So it's not necessarily a discrimination thing, it's just about a safety issue and matching the, the dog with the right home. Um, home ownership, obviously, it's not a, you know, it's not a deal breaker. I don't think you have to own a home. You certainly don't have to, don't have to own, own a home to adopt from Pity Rescue, but it is something that we do need to to, re, to ask about. Uh, home ownership does keep, you know, give people the flexibility. They don't have to, you know, worry about a landlord saying, oh, you can have a dog and then changing their mind later on. Uh, and also here, if adopting or fostering a pit bull specifically, we need to know the homeowner's insurance company that they use. 
Um, there are more and more ins more and more homeowners insurance companies. They are allowing more breeds under under their coverages, but there are still a lot of insurance companies that uh, they do have breed restrictions, and it's not just pit bulls. Um, any insurance company with breed restrictions is usually the same types of breeds: pit bulls, Rottweilers, German Shepherds, Dobermans, Huskies, Malamutes, Chow Chows, um, Cane Corsos. Presa Canarios, things, you know, dogs along those lines. There's usually all these same breeds that are on these restricted lists. So we need to know what homeowners insurance, number one, to let them know that they're trying to adopt a dog, they're, they're not gonna be covered, right? Their, their insurance company will drop them if they find out. And number two, let them know what insurance companies are appropriate then and do not have breed restrictions. Then, you know, as this date, you know, it's April, 2022, you know, uh, um, State Farm, Farm Bureau, I think Farmers Insurance, those are just to, uh, to name a few, but you could just do an internet search on um, whatever, Pitbull, Rottweiler, German Shepherd, friendly homeowners insurance companies. So we do need to know that. Um, we do need to know the landlord information and, uh, you know, because we will call the landlord, uh, especially for HOAs. I can't tell you how many times people say, oh, uh, yeah, we, we, we live in a, a, you know, a condo complex or a townhome complex or some kind of private community where there's an HOA and they say, oh, there's no breed restrictions. I call the office and you'd be surprised. People don't even know they have breed restrictions. People don't even know that they have weight restrictions. Uh, so we, we need to know all of these things in our application process. And, you know, some people might want to add municipal things. I mean, they're Sadly, there are still breed restrictions or BSL, breed specific legislation throughout the United States in certain municipalities. Um, you know, so like years ago in Denver and in places in Ohio, um, you know, there were breed restrictions at the municipal level. So, you know, we need to know those things uh, ahead of time. We don't want to place a dog for the dog to only have to be removed from the home. Right. So, um, and then we have references, you know, we ask for three personal references. You know, I mean, it, it, is that enough? I don't know. You know, some people do five. I don't know. I just figure if you can't get three people to say something nice about you, um, you know, that's a bigger problem. Um, you know, but you'd be surprised that I've, I've had personal references, you know, that would they said, you know, they would reveal things that the applicants didn't necessarily reveal. And it was just innocent through conversation, right? It's not like we're trying to catch someone in a lie. It's all about disclosing and revealing as much as we possibly can about a potential adopter so we can place the, have a best, the best chance of placing the dog in a forever home. Um, we do ask about their, their previous, um, you know, let me go back to relationship because although this isn't on the application, um, we do ask questions you know, we ask them what their relationship is with the applicant, how long they've known them, uh, did they ever meet him, any of their previous pets, if they've had previous pets, uh, what was their description of the animals, uh, you know, we'll probe things like that. Um, if it's a shorter term relationship and they don't have much experience, we'll ask them if they've ever been to their home, what kind of home do they live in, you know, is, is, is the home um, uh, not necessarily neat and tidy because that's neat and tidy is, is irrelevant. I mean, some people are a little messy. That's okay. Uh, as long as it's suitable for an animal, right? I mean, the, uh, there's times my dining room table turns into a, a file cabinet, right? Well, not so much now anymore in, in the paperless era, but a long time ago when we were, <laughs> I'm dating myself a little, you know, we were into a lot of papers. So I would have papers all over the freaking place, uh, you know, but some people work from home and their house gets a little messy. They might have kids and, you know, you got kids, you're going to have toys and socks and stuff all over the place, right? Who cares? As long as it's suitable, right? So we do ask the, the references for, for some, some identifying information to validate their relationship and their experience around the applicant. Uh, the veterinary information from prior, prior pets, if they have any, uh, some, especially younger people, they might be adopting a dog of their own for the first time. So obviously they're not going to have this information. However, they may, you know, their parents may have had, a, you know, they may have had a dog growing up and their parents were the people, uh, were the names of the, of the dog's owners. So uh, sometimes they will allow the veterinarian to talk to us about that because we do call the veterinarian to confirm that, you know, applicant A did actually take their dog to the vet and, you know, were they up, on, up, up to date on their shots? Was the dog spayed or neutered? Um, you know, if the applicant is reporting that the dog passed away of old age at 14 and we call the vet and they say, oh no, the dog was six, you know, it's a red flag. You know, we got to probe that. 
a little bit. So we will call the vet for sure. Um, make sure any current pets that are in the household, if they're up to date on their vaccine, specifically rabies, because rabies is required by law. So, uh, and then we do ask if pets are spayed or neutered uh, within the home. And if not, why, um, you know, sometimes there, there could be a, a medical or age reason if they have, a, you know, if they got a puppy and the puppy's too young to be spayed or neutered yet, that's fine. We never adopt a dog out that's not already uh, castrated, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, but I guess because I'm a trainer, it's important to know the, you know, the chemistry, potential chemistry issues with dogs going to a home, you know, uh, a, you know, a spade, um, a spade female going into a home with an intact male, like, you know, probably something we wouldn't do. You know what I mean? Uh, we prefer to have the, the animals are in the home already spayed or neutered. So we would probe that a little bit more. Um, you know, and obviously on this particular application, this is to foster or adopt. So we do request, you know, we'll, we'll request, you know, you what are you interested in, in doing, fostering, adopting, et cetera. Um, you know, we do ask about their environment. Do they have a fenced yard? Not a deal breaker for us, uh, you know, because I believe that dogs need to be walked anyway. Uh, but we do need to know what kind of fenced yard they have. They may think they have a secure fence and, you know, they'll say, oh, yeah, we, you know, we have a nice, you know, five foot stockade fence. Um, unbeknownst to them, many pit bulls can hop right over a five foot fence. So, you know, it's just some things to point out. They might not know that, right? They might they might uh, have to be um, educated or at least get an understanding that, you know, supervision is still part of the process, especially when you adopt a dog. Um, and we ask them about training and how the dog will be allowed in the house, things along those lines, um, you know, and where the dog will be kept when, when they're not home. I'm a huge proponent of crate training. Anyone watching my videos or channels, obviously, they know that I'm a huge proponent of crate training, especially for puppies or newly adopted dogs. Uh, ba -ba -ba here, how many hours a day will, you, will the dog or cat be alone? You know, again, these aren't deal breakers. These are just questions, basic questions that we're asking. Uh, who will be the primary caregiver? How do we? How do they plan on socializing the dog or training the dog? Um, are they prepared for the financial responsibility? People don't realize, you know, especially if it's a first-time um, dog owner, they might not realize the cost of food or training or daycare or you know medical or grooming. So, you know, again, it's just a, a, an area that we can probe deeper or help them have a better understanding of. Um, we do ask what they're going to feed the dog and we'll suggest or recommend uh, better alternatives if they happen to be, you know, considering a crappy food, you know what I mean? Um, we do ask them about their employment. We don't necessarily call employees, but we need to know that they are gainfully employed so they can provide for the dog. Uh, we do ask uh, what type of area they, they live in. This helps us provide them with a care schedule or training plan or to give them um, better understanding of the dog. Like, you know, a lot of dogs from the South, if they go, if they get adopted up North, there's a, a little bit of an adjustment there going from the country down in North Carolina, going back up into New Jersey where, or New York, where it's heavily populated, a lot of traffic, trucks and buses backfiring, right? So it gives us information to, to better help them. Um, we do ask them about their residential, their living situation, if they're planning to move, uh, you know, how long they've been in their current residence, if, if they've ever given up a pet, if so, why? Um, if they've ever given up a pet, it's got to be a really good reason for us to even consider them. I'm just going to be honest. I'm doing this a long time and, um, you know, not having enough time, the dog got too big, I got divorced. Uh, like, I'm sorry, that's, that's crap. There's just excuses. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you don't get a dog and then you don't incorporate that dog into your life. If you don't have the time, you make time. Uh, it's been my experience. People who don't have time, they have time to watch TV for three or four hours after work, but they don't have time for a dog. Uh, you know, they, they smoke two packs of cigarettes a day or they drink a latte every day, but they can't afford a dog walker. Uh, you know, I'm sorry. It's, you know, if you've ever given up a pet, it's gotta be a pretty damn good reason. You know, God forbid, a, a catastrophic life event, illness, things along those lines, I totally understand. Um, but if it's one of those bullcrap excuses, you ain't getting one of my dogs, sorry. Uh, but then again, this is an individual rescue thing, right? I'm just going over these questions for whoever's watching this video, spe you know, specifically for Angel, because we do wanna do everything we can in our power to, to try and match our dogs up with the right home, the right forever home. That's the whole goal here. It's not to criticize or judge people, right? I mean, I guess it is technically, but you know, I'm, my dogs, the dogs in my care are more important than your feelings. It's just the way it is. 
And if people don't like that, I, I, I don't know. I can't help you with that. That's on you, not me. Um, my job is, my responsibility is their welfare and finding them the right situation to get them in for a forever home. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then I asked them if there's a particular dog they're interested in, things on those lines, and you know, just some more probing questions. Uh, I do ask them about training and their ability to take a dog with special needs. Uh, special needs could be a medical case. It could be a dog that maybe has intolerance towards other animals, right? As much as I love pit bulls, I know that they could be like any other uh, any other terriers. They could be intolerant towards animals, especially as they mature. Uh, so I do consider that special needs. So I'll certainly ask them about that kind of stuff. Uh, and again, just basic care where the dog will sleep at night, how they'll care for the dog. Um, you know, and talk about creating a little more, uh, again, more about the environment, other animals that are there. Uh, and then this is just a, you know, a thank you for applying for pity rescue, uh, letting them know that, um, you know, that an application doesn't necessarily guarantee approval and things along those lines. So, so that's the adoption application. Uh, again, and this stuff happens because, you know, remember Angel that was asking about doing for me doing a video on this. Uh, she was watching a video on, I think, the home visit, which the home visit, that's after we get the application. That's after the adopter gets pre-approved. That's after they pick out the dog. Uh, that's and, and now we're on our way to bring the dog and do the home visit. So all this stuff is happening beforehand. Uh, you know, again, getting application, calling the references, calling the vet office verifying home ownership or uh you know approval from the landlord all that kind of stuff is all preliminary uh, and then we get into the contract so let's take a look at that okay so uh, here's a, a sample um adoption agreement slash contract um, you agree to adopt the dog with the call name of blah 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 we put the age the description of the dog the microchip number and we let them know the adoption donation is 250 or whatever it is um what people don't understand is that when when you have an, people call it the adoption fee. Uh, it's not an adoption fee. It's a donation to the rescue. Whoever's adopting the dog, they're donating the money to your rescue. They're not buying the dog. It's not an exchange of a product for money. They're literally just donating to your rescue. It's a tax write-off for them if you're a 501c3 organization like Pity Rescue is. So they're donating 250 bucks, um, you know, and obviously it's part of the adoption agreement. Um, so it is an adoption donation. Um, again, it's, rescues don't sell dogs, don't make money off dogs. I could tell you, I, I mean, I can't tell you the last time where our adoption donation covered the cost of the dog in our care. I mean, usually food and basic vet care right off the bat exceeds our adoption fee or donation, right? So it's just a donation to the rescue to help them continue operating. Obviously I have liability clause in here. Um, you know, everyone's liability clauses should be, uh, I guess, you know, appropriate for their situation. Uh, so ours, you know, again, we, we try to, you know, cross all our T's and dot all our I's just to protect our organization and our, uh, you know, our board members, uh, especially. Um, yeah, you know, obviously insurance protects you as well, but nobody wants to deal with lawsuits, right? So having a, a sound contract is helpful. I'm not a lawyer. So if you're unsure with verbiage that should go in your contract, obviously you could look at this one. You could, you know, do an internet search on other contracts, um, but try and get a lawyer to at least do some pro bono uh, work for you. If, you know, if you create a contract, see if you can find a lawyer just to take a peek at it, if there's any changes that can be made. Um, you know, so we have that in there. We have also have a clause in here that if you can no longer care for the animal, you agree to notify pity rescue immediately, right? So we can take the animal back into our care or assist you with placement, right? That is our agreement. That is, we are, we are, we are signing our names contractually being obligated. We are in this animal's life for the animal's life, right? So that is in our contract. If there's a problem we require, they contact us. Um, it helps us make sure, you know, uh, ensure the safety of, of our animals for their entire lives. Uh, reservation of life, uh, talk about home visits a little bit. Obviously, this is a precursor um, to a home visit sometimes, but sometimes we bring the contract during home visits, right? The, sometimes we'll do the home visit and sign the contract at the same time, right? We did the application, we let the adopter know that they're approved, and then sometimes we'll do the home visit with the dog. And if all goes well, 
you know, the dog will stay. Sometimes we need to do an extra home visit if all family members weren't there and we may need to, may need to meet all of them. Uh, you know, especially if there's kids involved. Sometimes if we have, even if we have a dog solid with kids, I still need to see with my own eyes how that animal interacts with the kids. More importantly, how the kids interact with the dog, right? Uh, so that we have some of that stuff in there, health and welfare, uh, making sure that this dog isn't gonna be adopted and then put out back in a, a 10 by 10 run and forgotten about. Right, we want our our dogs are house dogs. They are meant to be inside the house with us. Uh, you know, obviously, with the exception of going for walks and going out to, to pee and potty and play, uh, we want them. You know, we want our animals. You know, on cushy beds and sofas and stuff like that. So, um, <clears throat> you know, health behavior, behavior disclaimer. This is just uh, if we have any issues. Sometimes, you know, we might have a dog with a health or or behavior that we want to disclose, we are all about transparency. Uh, so we want to make sure that we disclose everything that we know of about the animals. Um, and then also in our rescue, which it's different because I'm a trainer, I any dog that people adopt from us, I actually commit to free lifetime training support for every dog that's adopted. Obviously I'm a trainer, so it's easier, it's easy for me to provide that service. Um, you know, but I have other rescues that they aren't, they, they're not trainers, but they actually contract with me and every, every dog that gets adopted by you know, that they adopt out to adopters, they come, that dog comes with a free, uh, zoom consult with me. So the, I, I contract with the rescue and the rescue provides that zoom for their adopters. Um, so that's something that people could do if you happen to be a trainer or you have you know, a decent foundation in, in training and behavior and you want to offer that, I think it's it's good to offer um, or at least um, provide uh, some kind of training support going forward. But again, you know, it's, again, it's easier for me because I'm a trainer and we do rescue. So, um, and this is condition and conditional approval. Uh, again, these, this is where my health notes and behavioral notes go. And then our signatures. And what I do too on our contract, I have tips for um, introducing the dog to the new environment. Just some little tidbits on how they should allow the dog to interact with the environment uh, initially. Uh, and then I have some leadership tips um, just to, so they can implement some structure uh, for the dog starting on day one. So that is my adoption contract. So let me stop sharing this. So that I did this video for, again, for Angel who, who requested that I do that on one of my other videos. Uh, so hopefully this is helpful. Again, uh, you can go to pityrescue.com and you can actually see these forms for yourself. <clears throat> Excuse me, you could download them, they're PDFs. And one thing I did not mention, which I think is really important uh, with choosing the right pet, uh, choosing the right applicant or adopter is intuition or gut, okay? Uh, Sometimes, you know, there's might be some things that are on the application that, I mean, heck, I, I adopted a dog to a 19 year old college kid one time and then nothing against college kids, but I was a 19 year old college kid at one point in my life. And I'm like, mm, that was kind of tough, but let me tell you, this kid was mature beyond his years. And although there were some things on his, his application that I wasn't a hundred percent confident about, I had this feeling, this gut, I just knew. I knew that this was the right person for the dog at the time. And this is going back, I don't know, <clears throat> probably 10 years ago or so. Uh, and it worked out that, you know, dog it, it lived till, you know, the, unfortunately the dog got cancer, but it was an amazing home. Uh, it was an amazing home. Um, the dog didn't pass, passed away not too long ago. Um, but the, I mean, she was spoiled. He was such a good dog owner, guardian, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, and, you know, you sometimes you just have a gut. Now, the flip side is also true. You could have the most impeccable application. You can have the most amazing references. Something's just not sitting right with you. I'm not saying you shouldn't adopt to that person, but if something's telling you something's off, you got to trust that gut intuition, at least to probe a little deeper into some areas that you may not feel 100% comfortable with, even though it, you know, it, it looks, it's all shiny and perfect on the surface, something's gnawing at you, uh, you know, it's okay to say no, right? I, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, like when we know that a, there's an, a good application on a dog, we get excited, right? And our emotions come up, oh my God, this is great. You know, me is finally going to get a home, for instance, which is actually a true story, a dog we've had for a long time, 
years ago and she ultimately got her forever home uh you know your emotions come they get the best of you and you're like oh my god you can't let your emotions dictate the adoption process you absolutely can't it's really hard too and i'm emotional when it comes with the, comes to dogs you got to take a step back take a deep breath if something's not right or something's in here you you got to probe it a little bit do it right and and at the end of the day it's okay to say no it's not personal at all right uh you know we we have to do what's in the best interest of our dogs right i'd rather not adopt a dog and be wrong than adopt a dog and be wrong you know what i'm saying <laughs> you know there's there's a fine line there right so uh so take that for what it's worth. Anyway, Angel, I hope this helps you and I hope this helps anyone else uh, who's uh, you know looking to find out about the adoption, the, the adoption process or approval process. Um, so again, if anyone, anyone out there like Angel wants me to provide content similar to this and, and Angel, if you watch this and this isn't what you had in mind, <laughs> Let me know. I'll do another video for sure. Or, you know, we could certainly, uh, you know, do a little YouTube collaboration as well. And uh, maybe I can get you on and we can plug your new rescue as well. So hope this helps. Thanks, guys, for sharing. And listen, if you like what you see, give me a thumbs up. Take a peek around my channel. Consider subscribing. And again, any other content you want me to upload, please feel free. I appreciate your support and I'll see you all soon.